prevent wildfire. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Welcome to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I'm glad you could join me for this show, where I discuss my favorite topics, which, which is movies. My favorite topic, I should say, singular. But anyway, while I'm still getting the... Uh, let's see. I'm still trying to get the volume on my, on my headphones adjusted, but I think that's probably how I'm going to do it for now. But anyway... So i got five new movies to review for you for this show, but first, let's get into what's topping the box office. These are the top ten box office winners of this past weekend. Number one at the box office is a little bit of a surprise given its competition, but the fact that it's a new movie and it's directed by Christopher Nolan certainly had some currency. That movie was Dunkirk, which opened at with $50.5 million at the U.S. box office and $107.4 million internationally. And that's against a budget of $100 million. Number two at the box office is a movie I actually kind of expected to be in the top ten, and that is, or at least definitely in the top five, maybe even the top three, and that is Girls Trip, the latest from, well, a number of people, particularly boasts an all-star cast, including Regina Hall, Queen Latifah, and Jada Pinkett Smith. It opened at $31.2 million at the U.S. box office against a budget of $27.7 million. So, Girls Trip already is a tentative hit. And I forgot to mention what Dunkirk was. Dunkirk is so far not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a tentative hit. Spider-Man Homecoming in its third week in release drops from number two last week to number three this week, having earned $22.2 million, which is not bad for its third week in release. But against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far grossed $251.9 million here in the States and $571.9 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, Around the world, it is a certified hit, so good for Spider-Man Homecoming. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. War for the Planet of the Apes probably has the biggest surprise in that it was number one at the box office last week, and this week it's number four at the box office, having grossed just $20.9 million. Against a budget of $150 million, War for the Planet of the Apes has so far grossed $98.2 million here in the States, and... 175.3 million around the world. So that makes it not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a tentative hit. Hopefully it will be a certified hit in both instances here in the States and around the world, but of course we'll have to see. Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets is a big surprise in that it opened at number five at the box office this week, but wait till you hear its international numbers. The this weekend, it grossed just $17 million against a budget of $177 to $210 million. It's an estimate. Nobody knows exactly, or very few people know exactly how much money it made. But here, oh, excuse me, internationally, now remember, here in the States, it grossed just $17 million, which is chump change. Around the world, so far, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets has so far grossed $175.3 million. Excuse me. It has grossed $923.5 million. I totally screwed that up, but $923.5 million around the world. So I don't know how this is, but Valerian, and you know the rest, has not even come close to being a hit. It may not be a hit here in the States. Around the world, it's already certified by quite a bit. Despicable Me 3 is number 6 at the box office this weekend, having grossed $13 million this week. Against a budget of $80 million, Valerian the City of the a Thousand Planets has so far grossed in the United States $213.6 million and around the world $732.5 million. So it goes without saying that Despicable Me 3 is doing really well for its budget. And it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, which is actually more than can be said for Cars 3, surprisingly enough. 
Baby Driver is number seven at the box office this weekend, having grossed having grossed six point one million dollars at the box office in its fourth weekend release. This or rather so far, Baby Driver on a budget of thirty four million dollars has so far grossed eighty four point three million dollars here in the States and one hundred eighteen point seven million dollars around the world, making it a certified hit here in the States and globally. The Big Sick is number eight at the box office this weekend, having grossed $5 million in the United States this weekend. But I don't have the information for how much, how much it costs to make. So far, it's grossed $24.5 million. I would take an educated guess to say it's a certified hit here in the States, but I don't know. I also don't have the international numbers for you yet. Wonder Woman, however, I can already tell you it's a certified hit here in the States and around the world. This weekend it grossed $4.6 million, and against a budget of $149 million, it has so far grossed $389 million here in the States and $779.6 million around the world. What's really astonishing is that Wonder Woman, despite getting much better reviews than Despicable Me 3, has made this amount of money, $779.6 million, in eight weeks that it took Despicable Me to almost make in four weeks. I don't know how that is. And finally, another movie that's a little bit of a surprise in terms of how much money it's grossing is Wish Upon. Now, Wish Upon debuted at number seven last week. This week, it's number ten. So it is unlikely that Wish Upon will ever reach the top five or become a box office hit of any kind. However, Wish Upon grossed $2.5 million this weekend. Against a budget of $12 million, Wish Upon has so far grossed $10.5 million here in the States and $13.6 million around the world. So it's not breaking any box office records, but it will eventually make all its money back probably by next week. If it made $2.5 million this week, it should make around that or close to that next week, even if it's not in the top 10. But my guess is that Wish Upon has gotten a lot of negative word of mouth. But even still, for $12 million, it's not a hit yet here in the States, but my guess is it will be by next week. But around the world, it is already a tentative hit. Will it be a certified hit? International audiences are kind of hard to read, so I really can't say at this moment. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is Dunkirk. This is the latest from director Christopher Nolan, and while it is fictitious, it is actually inspired by actual events, specifically the Dunkirk e evacuation, also known as codename Operation Dynamo. So this was the evacuation of Allied soldiers, and by Allied I mean British and French, from the beaches and harbor of Dunkirk, which is a community in the north of France. Now this happened between May 26th and June 4th, 1940, during World War II. Now again, remember, this is 1940. So while England and France, not to mention Germany, was heavily invested in World War II, the United States was not involved yet. And actually, it's not only the United States and France were involved in this, in this evacuation, but also platoons from Canada, Poland, Belgium, and the Never Netherlands were also involved. However, this movie focuses primarily on the British. Yeah, there are no Americans in this movie at all, and nobody even pretending to be Americans. So this, you, you really kind of have to know the history of Dunkirk, maybe before going into this movie, but even if you don't know any history of it, you'll still be probably amazed by the odds that the British soldiers well, the Allied soldiers in general, had to overcome in order to evacuate Dunkirk, which was, for all intents and purposes, surrounded on all sides by the forces, primarily the German army. So there were three battles going on, which in this movie kind of divided itself into three distinct chapters. One is the mole, in other words, land, Number two is the sea, and three, the air. So there, are, there were British soldiers on the beaches of Dunkirk trying to escape against all odds. 
that's the mole, in other words, land. Of course, there was the sea where ships were coming out of Dun Dunkirk port in order to escape. And, of course, there was the air invasion of the, the German soldiers. And there were also Allied troops in airplanes trying to shoot down the German forces as well. So this is told primarily from three perspectives, but there are a lot of characters in this movie. There's also very little dialogue. Consequently, there are some great actors in this movie, but not a lot of them have a lot to say. For that reason, while there's a really good ensemble cast, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, there isn't an actor in this movie that stands out from all the rest. However, every single actor in this movie is great. And the movie focuses primarily on one of the soldiers who is part of the mole. In other words, he is on the beaches of, of Dunkirk, France, and he's trying to escape by any means necessary. His character is, well, the, the character he play, the actor playing this prime main character is Fionn Whitehead in a career-defining performance. There are also some great performances by the likes of Harry Styles, formerly of the boy band One Direction. And once I probably said boy band, you probably thought that ah, he's just going to be sort of a secondary character with not very many lines. It turns out that Harry Styles actually has quite a few lines in this movie, and he's probably the actor in this movie who has the most lines. But it wasn't just soldiers or allied forces who were rescuing the, sol the allied forces who were surrounded in Dunkirk. It turns out that on the sea, there was a civilian ship who was going to Dunkirk and might not have gone there to rescue soldiers in particular, but turns out that that is exactly what they did. And it turns out this boat, that's a civilian boat, is run by a character who's played by Mark Rylance, Academy Award winner Mark Rylance. And it's great to see him on the screen after last year's underrated BFG. And finally, probably the most action in this film takes place in the air, or at least the biggest turning points. And I'm not going to exactly reveal what happened, although probably when I said that the Dunkirk was probably one of the biggest evacuations in World War II, that might give you a little bit of a spoiler as to how this movie's going to go. But honestly, there are a lot of great things to say about Dunkirk. As I said before, Christopher Nolan directed and wrote the screenplay for this movie. He also co-produced it. But when I read last week that Christopher Nolan was going to, had written this movie, I initially thought it might be historical fiction. Not exactly. The evacuation of Dunkirk, France actually happened. It might probably be considered historical fiction, though, because it's not based on a book written by a, a historian of any kind. And I don't know exactly what motivated Christopher Nolan to direct and write this movie, or just write it in general, but... He did an amazing job with this. I liked that it had little dialogue, and I liked the fact that all the a there were no actors that really stood out. All of them had their parts to play, almost the same as the soldiers in Dunkirk had their roles to play in order to get a, a successful evacuation against all odds. And it's another thing to note that 1940A, the U.S. was not participating in the war at this point that would be for another year and a half and b i had a oh yes the movie doesn't tell you what year in which it takes place you kind of have to look that up afterwards but i like that because when well i'm running out of time right now but i'm giving this movie my rating of a knockout. It is a great World War II flick. It makes war look like hell, as every great war movie does, and the acting is understated but fantastic. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. This is the latest from director Luc Besson, best known to American audiences for having written and directed such movies as Leon the Professional, which is still a cult classic to this day, 
had a great uh, perform had great performances in that movie by Jean Reno and a very young Natalie Portman. And then he followed that up three years later with The Fifth Element, which which did modestly well at the box office when it came out over 20 years ago. And I can't believe I'm saying that, but yes, it did come out over 20 years ago. But it's since gone on also to be a cult classic. He also most recently directed the movie Lucy, which starred Scarlett Johansson and Morgan Freeman. That came out three years ago, and that's a movie that I thought had impressive special effects wasn't crazy about the story. I also wasn't crazy about the false scientific facts, but from Luc Besson, it was an enjoyable film to watch. And Valerian, the City of a Thousand Planets is a movie that I'm also mixed about. I thought the special effects in this movie were magnificent. It had some great CGI and motion capture animation, and some characters were really good, others were quite amusing, and I thought the story was actually pretty solid. But let me tell you the story before I get into any of my critiques. So Valerian the City of a Thousand Planets is about a dark force that threatens Alpha, which is a vast metropolis and home to species from a thousand planets. So when they say the city of a thousand planets, it's not a city that actually has a thousand planets in it. That would have been cool to see. So the title is slightly misleading, but that's not the only problem I have with the title. So anyway, this, uh, this vast metropolis, special operatives Valerian and Laureline, Valerian played by Dane DeHaan and Laureline played by actress Cara Delevingne, must race to identify the marauding menace and safeguards not just Alpha, and excuse me, and safeguard not just Alpha, but the future of the universe. So the movie starts out really great, not only with some eye-catching opening credits, but also with this this shot of this utopian planet. And the when you see this planet and all the creatures who inhabit it, there are some human like creatures who reside on this planet and they speak a different tongue than English and there are no subtitles that are given to you to give you a sense of what they're talking about but you don't need subtitles actually because I heard a study that 94% of communication is nonverbal but I think that the motion capture animation on these aliens is so good and they, they communicate so well, their, their body movement is fluid, that you really don't need subtitles. You get the gist of what they're saying. So anyway, this utopian planet, as it usually goes in science fiction movies, experiences some sort of meteoroid crash, or some meteor, meteorite crash, excuse me, and that threatens the life on their planet. So one of the creatures sends a clairvoyant message to Major Valerian, who's played by Dane DeHaan. And ultimately, Major Valerian and his Sergeant Laureline, who's played by Cara Delevingne, join forces and try to track down what happened to this planet and also save the vast metropolis of Alpha. So there's a lot going on here. There are some very interesting creatures one of the things I was worried about was not that this movie would rip off The Fifth Element, even though it has some things in common with The Fifth Element. I thought people would take a look at this film and inevitably compare it to Star Wars. And I think a lot of people are going to do that, but the good thing about this film is, yes, it takes place in space. Yes, it's about maverick humans who are out to save the universe. But it's not Star Wars. And I actually... One of the other opening shots that I liked in the very beginning of the movie, before they showed this utopian planet, was the advancement of 21st century technology and beyond that shows in 2031 different inhabitants boarding the International Space Station and then showing the space station growing from there. I thought that was a great shot. But I do think that when Dane DeHaan comes on the screen and starts acting, that's when the film goes down a notch for me because Dane DeHaan has the same problem that Rooney Mara has. He's very good at acting intensely and when he's in, in dark and brooding roles. 
I mean, nowhere is that more apparent than Dane DeHaan's breakthrough role in the one of the few found footage movies that I like, Chronicle, where he ultimately got superpowers and evolved into a supervillain rather than a superhero. I thought he did great in that movie. And as much crap as people give The Amazing Spider-Man 2, I did think Dane DeHaan did well as Harry Osborn, who later turned into the Green Goblin. The problem is he was introduced too soon. But anyway, Dane DeHaan here is supposed to play a guy who's really cocky and who's hitting on Sar- um, his fellow Sergeant Laureline often. And what doesn't work is that Dane DeHaan, because he's so used to playing these other dark roles, comes off as monotone. He doesn't come off as appealing at all, and he and Cara Delevingne don't have the necessary chemistry it takes for you to root for him to get the girl. So I'm not going to tell you exactly how it ends, but I, I do have to say that there were some interesting characters, some of whom overstayed their welcome, like these triplet aliens who kind of reminded me in terms of personality of the Lollipop Guild and the Wizard of Oz. They kind of stayed on too long, overstayed their welcome. There's another alien who's played by Rihanna, who is only in the movie for five or ten minutes, and I don't think it's because I think Rihanna's pretty, although I do, but I thought that Rihanna's character was appealing enough so that she should have been in the movie longer. I also thought she had some funny moments. So Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets tells a unique story. It's not like Star Wars. You have to trust me on that. It has some great special effects, but the leading actor, Dane DeHaan, needed some work. Cara De- Delevingne did fine, but for, for Dane DeHaan being miscast, I have to give this movie my rating of a checkout. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is To the Bone, which is a Netflix original film. Reportedly, Netflix bought To the Bone for six or seven million dollars i don't exactly have the information for you as to how much it costs this movie to make but it doesn't really matter at this point what is to the bone about to the bone is about a young woman who is dealing with anorexia and she meets an unconventional doctor who challenges her to face her condition and embrace life this is a movie that is directed and written by a filmmaker whose name is marty noxon who is a woman, she's over 50 years old, and reportedly, not just her, but other people who are involved in the making of this film actually dealt with eating disorders, not just anorexia nervosa, even though the the character in this movie, uh, the main character, Ellen, who's played by Lily Collins, deals with anorexia here. She's actually brought to a group home filled with people with eating disorders, and not just anorexia nervosa. There are others who deal with bulimia nervosa. And just to give you a little bit of a textbook definition of the differences between anorexia and bulimia, anorexia is when somebody eats very little. I think they just eat enough that they think to survive. So they have, of course, a dysmorphed body image. And they think they're heavy even when the whole world can see that they're deathly thin. Bulimia is when you eat food, but then you repeatedly throw up your food. So it's about as dangerous as... <laughs> it, it's considered as dangerous as anorexia, although I couldn't exactly tell you in scientific terms why that is. And there's also one other person in this home to which Ellen, played by Lily Collins, goes, who is also dealing with compulsive overeating. And that's just another one of the characters in this movie. So there are a lot of scenes in this film that are a little hard to watch. However, it's not a film that would, I think, draw any people away from it. I think people who have struggled with eating disorders would get a lot from watching this film. I I have not personally suffered from an eating disorder, but I know some people who have. And it's it's a it's a struggle and certainly this movie might challenge people's beliefs in the sense that people who are not anorexic take a look at people who are anorexic. I know I've done this before and they think to themselves, 
why don't you just eat something? It's just that simple. Well, actually, it isn't. And the movie doesn't go into exactly what makes anorexia difficult for people, but it does emphasize that it is anorexia, bulimia, and all these other eating disorders are very much like other addictions in that there are certain patterns to which people with eating disorders follow that are addictive, that they can't stop doing, and they need to change that behavioral pattern or else they'll die. And I think that the the people in this movie, not just Lily Collins, but a lot of other people demonstrate that very well. I also read in trivia that Lily Collins herself actually struggled with anorexia. What made me a little worried is that this movie makes Lily Collins look really, really thin. And I don't know if she actually lost the weight to be in this movie or if it was just computer effects to make her look thinner. But she looks deathly ill. There's even one part where she takes off her shirt and you can see her rib cages. Lily Collins is a very attractive woman, but I found myself recoiling when I saw her with her exposed rib cages. Uh, it's, I, I think To the Bone is not a depressing movie, but I think it does very well showing you what people with eating disorders go through, how they struggle. And the unconventional doctor who, to whom Ellen, again, Lily Collins, is sent to work on her eating disorder is Dr. Beckham, who's played by Keanu Reeves in a very subtle and very effective performance here. I, th- I think Keanu Reeves brought his own kind of perspective to this role that otherwise could have been maybe a little bit two-dimensional, but Dr. Beckham is one of those doctors who knows what he's doing. He knows how to treat eating disorders, but he also knows what not to do. And I thought that he had a very good performance in here. Of course, Lily Collins is probably the most powerful performance in this movie. Another noteworthy performance, of course, all of them are really good, but one of the performances that that stayed with me the most, that still stays with me after watching this film, is the one by Leslie Bibb, who also is struggling with anorexia. And you can tell that just by looking at her. Again, I don't know if computer graphics made her look as thin as she does, but you, also, you will also recoil when you see her as thin as she is. And what makes matters even worse is that Leslie Bibb's character in this movie is pregnant. So when you are struggling with anorexia and you're pregnant, you're not only endangering your own life, but you're also greatly endangering the life of the child within you. So, To the Bone is a movie that I don't know if if theaters would have put this movie out for people to pay and see. And it, it's great that that Netflix is probably the perfect platform for it. I give it my rating of a knockout because, yeah, there are some sad moments, and yeah, there are moments that make you cringe or recoil, but it's not an overall abrasive movie. It's one that's certainly relatable to anyone, not, not just anyone who's had an eating disorder, but anyone who's had an addiction of any kind. And I think if, if families are watching this together, it is rated TVMA, which is kind of like the R rating, but I do, th- I do recommend that families watch this movie together, especially uh, probably older teenagers, maybe even teenagers around the age of 13 or 14, just to know the... Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is City of Ghosts, which might sound like a horror movie, but it isn't. It's actually a documentary detailing the efforts of Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, which is a handful of anonymous activists who banded together after their homeland was taken over by ISIS in 2014. Raqqa, by the way, R-A-Q-Q-A, is a city that's located in Syria, which is 
a country that's had its problems with terrorist attacks, particularly by ISIS over the last couple of years. So, with deeply personal access, this is the story of a brave group of citizen journalists as they face the realities of life undercover, on the run, and in exile, risking their lives to stand up against one of the greatest evils in the world today. And this is a movie that I think will probably be nominated for Best Documentary, at least I hope it does. So far it's screened at this year's Tribeca Film Festival, at the Sundance Film Festival, and fortunately it's been picked up by Amazon Studios, so while you can maybe see it at an art house cinema near you, you can definitely check it out on Amazon. And I probably just gave away what I thought of the film, but it is astonishing to me how much damage ISIS have, has done, how, how they have passed themselves, uh, uh, excuse me, how they have dubbed themselves the Islamic State, and how many lives and families, how, how many lives they've ruined, and how many families they've torn apart. And I really have to applaud the effort of the efforts of the blog Raqqa is being slaughtered silently. So there are these group, there's, there's this group, you're introduced to probably about five individuals who work for this website. They started it off in Raqqa, Syria, and what happened was eventually members of this, this activist group, Raqqa, is being slaughtered silently, were actually apprehended and executed by ISIS, which forced a number of these members of this website to flee Syria. I kind of wish the, the documentary had gone into more detail about how they got out of Syria, but that alone would just make a good movie in general. However, eventually they do flee successfully. Some end up in Germany, and others end up in Turkey, which is over the border from Syria. They're safer than they were in Syria, but still, as many of us know from listening to the news, ISIS still has an influence beyond the borders of whatever territories or countries they occupy. And that's probably most notable from all the terrorist attacks that have happened over the last three years or so, particularly the one in Orlando, Florida, and the, the handful of terrorist attacks in Paris, France. Of course, uh, the, the trick of how to stop ISIS, well, let me put that a different way. Stopping ISIS is more difficult, arguably, than stopping the Taliban, mainly because the ISIS is far more underground than the Taliban was, and the Taliban was pretty underground, literally and figuratively. Even though ISIS is probably more figuratively underground, their influence can be shown. And there are actually some startling and appalling footage that Raqqa is being slaughtered silently has put onto their website and that this documentary, for lack of a better term, documents that shows not only ISIS actually executing detractors, but also how they're brainwashing children into believing their ideology. It's really scary. And what I, what I loved about City of Ghosts is not only that it gives Raqqa's being slaughtered silently the attention and the acclaim that the group deserves, especially considering all that these activists have been through up to this point, but I also liked how the movie allowed the activists to speak for themselves. A lot of the activists go by only their first names, like Hamoud, Hassan, Muhammad, and there's a reason for that, because they are still in hiding from ISIS to this day. In fact, the places that the members of Raqqa is being slaughtered silently have hit out in this movie were still identified as undisclosed location, which means they're, they're still reporting on what they hear from Syria, and even though there is better internet access in Turkey and in Germany than there was in Syria, they still have to really struggle to get their news from the source. And the same thing that can be said about Raqqa could possibly be said about 
Aleppo and other cities in Syria, as well as many other places in the Middle East, such as Iraq, Iran, and so on. So I'm not going to get into politics as to why the U.S. hasn't taken down ISIS yet. I understand that it's a lengthy process, but that's not the point of this movie. The point of the movie is to show that even in some... And actually, when I was watching this film, I'm sorry to cut my thought off, I thought about the tagline that the Washington Post has given itself since Trump was elected president, and most especially since Trump has been giving grief to the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other news outlets as fake news. The Washington Post has given itself the tagline, democracy dies in darkness. City of Ghosts is telling us that these non-professional journalists shed some journalistic light in this darkness. And there's a great scene where Raqqa is being slaughtered silently, is given the award and attention that it deserves from being in from from an award ceremony they attended in New York City. There's actually a great clip where this unassuming photography woman is actually taking a picture of the five attending members of Raqqa's being slaughtered silent and she's telling them to smile, you know, as they they're given their award and they don't smile. I guess, yeah, it shows that this camera woman knew absolutely nothing about what these guys have been through. City of Ghosts is a great documentary. Gets my rating of a knockout. It is a testament to journalism films, fictional and non-fictional. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Take Me. This is a movie that's rated TVMA, and I'm not sure exactly where it premiered exactly, but it can be found on Netflix and on Amazon Prime, or Amazon Streaming, or whatever that service is called. It actually, its official release date was given as May 5th, but I just recently saw it. And Take Me is a comedy, well, not to mention a crime comedy, about a guy named Ray, who's played by director Pat Healy. And when I say director Pat Healy, I mean that not only does he star in this movie, but he also directs the film. So Ray is a fledging entrepreneur who specializes in high-end stimulated abductions. He jumps at the chance when a mysterious client contracts him for a weekend kidnapping with a handsome payday at the end. But the job isn't all that seems. So this high-end stimulated uh, uh, abduction, this is where, this is kind of like a kidnapping where somebody is taken unsuspectingly, probably drugged, handcuffed, blindfolded, and thrown into somebody's van. And in this case, the van of Ray Moody, who's played again by writer, writer, um, actor, and director Pat Healy. So when Pat Healy, or rather Ray Moody, the character, takes whatever unsuspecting victim or suspecting victim into his van, basically he ties him to a chair, keeps him in the basement for an extended period of time, and more or less tortures the person. I'm gonna put my fo- I'm gonna put my phone down. <laughs> Sorry about this. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty with one of my sources of video, but anyway. So when this per when Ray Moody kidnaps somebody and connect or ties them to a chair in a basement, he tortures them a little bit. And it's usually kind of alternative therapy in that there's one person we're introduced to who is a compulsive overeater and is morbidly obese. And he, of course, would rather choose a bacon cheeseburger over a garden salad, although (laughs) most of us would, except maybe if we're vegan. And he force feeds him these, these high fat burgers until he, uh, until the person agrees to actually have a sustainable diet. So the catch with these high end stimulated, simulated abductions is that the person who's being captured agrees to be captured. So, ultimately, this wild weekend happens when 
Ray Moody gets contacted by a woman who is a high-end business executive named... Okay, for, oh, okay. for some reason, the, the computer's not giving me the name of the character, but... Oh, there's this woman named Anna St. Blair, who's played by Taylor Schilling. And this... Taylor Schilling, you probably best know from shows such as Orange is the New Black. Actually, that's the only show she's been in. She's been in other movies before, but Orange is the New Black is her claim to fame. So anyway, Anna St. Blair offers Ray Moody $5,000, which he desperately needs, in order to be kidnapped for a whole weekend. So you know that something's up with Taylor Schilling because she's an actress who is... Of course, very attractive, but she has a sort of wild quality in her eyes that makes her seem like she's up to something. I think that serves her well in the show Orange is the New Black. She's one of those women who would participate in a beauty pageant, but she could probably kill the first and second place contestants and probably be holding a knife and not thinking anything about it. It's a weird comparison, I know, but this movie is kind of an uneven comedy. It is a comedy, and it is sort of a, a crime movie, but it would have worked better as probably a more farcical comedy. Pat Healy, I think, is a competent actor, but in this movie, he almost miscasts himself. And I think that he probably would have served himself better as just the director of this movie. He didn't write the movie. Another writer by the name of Mike Mikowski actually wrote this movie. And it's, a, it's an interesting concept. And certainly the game of cat and mouse that Ray Moody and Anna, Anna St. Blair play is intriguing. But I didn't think there were enough twists in the, in the movie. And I didn't think that it was particularly funny. Somebody getting kidnapped against their will, or maybe even for their will, and getting tied to a chair and, and tortured is just not in and of itself funny. There's also a dubious scene where Ray Moody actually walks into a bank and asks for a loan for this business, which is a really, really bad idea. I think it actually would have been a better movie if they actually detailed how somebody gets into this business, what would motivate them to get into this business, and do they like it? And you don't get any of that... Uh, any sort of character from Pat Healy. Um, he looks like a serial killer. He looks, he has his hair parted. He's usually kind of monotone throughout the whole movie. Kind of one of those guys who says all the right things, but his demeanor and the way he says it makes you doubt him instantly, which I think would make him play a great serial killer. But I think that any other comic actor probably would have approach this subject a little bit more lightly. I could see Will Ferrell or John C. Riley playing this kind of role, and the movie would bring a lot of laughs to it, while also maintaining that good le level of darkness that would make it an edgy comedy. But as it stands right now, it's a movie to which I give my rating of a strikeout. I, d I do think Pat Healy's a good actor. He miscast himself in this. I liked Taylor Schilling in this movie a lot. I liked kind of the cat and mouse games she played with the character of Ray Moody, but it's not worth recommending because it shouldn't. a movie like this should not have been as dark or as uneven as it ultimately became. So now that I've reviewed all the movies I have to review for this show, it's now time to get into my segment, What's Coming Out Next? In other words, the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. And there are a number of big ones, some of which I'm excited about seeing, others maybe not so much. So I'll start with the movie I'm not looking forward to seeing as much, and that is The Emoji Movie. Yeah, I, they finally made a movie out of The Emojis. It's one of those crazy ideas that might actually succeed. I don't really get what all the fuss is about about emojis. I, I get that people send smiley faces. That's, that's nothing new. The, the smiley face has been popular on the internet since probably civilians were allowed to use the internet in the early 90s. What I don't get is how the poop emoji has become a thing. Not only is it popular, but they've also made toys out of the poop emoji. They've made pillows out of it. I don't get that. 
I also don't get why it has eyes and a mouth and smiles. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not this old curmudgeon who just doesn't get the internet. I just don't get why people are so crazy about emojis. But anyway, the emoji movie is about a guy, or rather an emoji whose name is Gene, who is a multi-expressional emoji. Don't know what that means. Sets out on a journey to become a normal emoji. And I guess from the tagline of this film that the movie is going to be about a character who tries to find himself only to find that being himself is really what he wanted to be all along. That's what I'm guessing. Just from the just from the tagline. So I I don't know what to say about this movie. I'm not expecting very much. It's a movie that's probably going to be dated in about a month, but I will see it and I'll let you know what I think. I I try not to keep my expectations high or low, but Sometimes going into a movie with low expectations is a good thing. I'll let you know. There have been movies that, that have come... There have been animated movies that have come out so far that have been really good. Uh, Cars 3 was not the best animated movie I've ever seen ever, but it's probably going to be better than the Emoji movie. I'm, at least I'm guessing. But there have also been some bad animated movies that have come out this year, like Boss Baby. But I'll see the Emoji movie, I'll let you know what I think, but I'm not expecting much from it. Another movie that's coming out this weekend is Atomic Blonde. And this movie I actually am looking forward to seeing. So this is about an undercover MI6 agent who is sent to Berlin during the Cold War. Okay, so this probably takes place in the 70s or 80s. To investigate the murder of a fellow agent and recover a missing list of double agents. This movie stars Charlize Theron and also co-stars James McAvoy, John Goodman, and Eddie Marson, amongst other people. I don't watch the previews, but it's been a little while since Charlize Theron's been in a movie. I think the last one she was in was Mad Max Fury Road, and that was an incredible movie. So, at least Charlize Theron is choosing her projects very well so far. We'll see how Atomic Blonde is. I'll let you know what I think of that movie when I review it next week week. Another movie I will definitely be seeing is one called An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. This comes 11 years after Al Gore's ground, excuse me, groundbreaking movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Well, Al, why did it take Al Gore so long to create a sequel to this movie? Because mainly we had a we had a president for 8 years out of the 11 since this movie's been released who was not a climate change denier. When An Inconvenient Truth came out in 2006, one of the biggest climate change deniers was our then-president, George W. Bush. Well, we got a climate change denier again in the White House, of course, Donald Trump, and other Republicans like Mike Pence and Paul Ryan are also noteworthy climate change deniers. So, uh, more than a decade after An Inconvenient Truth brought climate change into the heart of popular culture, the follow-up shows just how close we are to a real energy revolution. So this actually sounds more uplifting than An Inconvenient Truth was. And a lot of people who saw... And let me give you an example of how powerful An Inconvenient Truth was. Not only did it deservedly win the, docu uh, the Academy Award for Best Documentary, but Fox News gave An Inconvenient Truth a great review. Fox News. So when, some, when an organization that more or less does not like Al Gore gives his movie a good review, you know it's good. So I'm not sure how an inconvenient sequel is going to be, but I'll see it and I'll review it for you next week. And that's about all the time I have for this show, Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures.